Hi, I'm Tom Mackey. And I'm Trudy Jacobson. And we're joined today by a special guest, Dr. Ronnie Mather, who's Associate Professor of Psychology at SUNY Empire State College and also Interim Dean of our Center for Distance Learning. Welcome, Ronnie. Thank you, Tom. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Hi, Trudy. Hi, Hi Ronnie. Yeah, we are as well. So what we really want to do now as we're approaching the end of the course is really dig deeper into what metacognition is. It is such an important part of the meta-literacy framework. We've looked at models. We looked at the meta-literate learner model several times throughout the course. And we really want to take a closer look now and try to have a deeper understanding of the background of the term and how it fits in with meta-literacy. So first, let me just ask a really basic question. What is metacognition, and, how, and can you provide an example for us? Yeah, I mean, metacognition had uh, a fourfold root in the history of ideas. The first root probably was in classical epistemology, uh, classical philosophy. Plato was interested in metacognition, uh, his ideas around knowledge, his idea of knowledge as justified true belief. Uh, is a metacognitive argument. Uh, so metacognition has been around since Plato, and you can find uh, other examples of it throughout the history of ideas. Its second root is probably in biology. Um, I've read your text with some interest. Uh, biology has always been interested in the way that complex systems monitor, th monitor themselves. Sorry. So, I mean, there, there, are, there is a, a biological element, which I'll come on to later. Um, Flavel was very interested in feelings of knowledge as well as verbalized knowledge. So there's the biology element. And then, of course, you, you talk about in your text uh, behavior, uh, the sociology of action. In the 60s and 70s, the, the sociology of action perspective was very interested in the reflective monitoring of behavior. So uh, the, there was this, this aspect too. And finally, of course, then came John Flavel, who, whose texts around in the 70s actually introduced metacognition into mainstream psychology. And uh, that has continued right up into the present day with uh, cognitive neuroscience. So there's, there's a fourfold route. Um, I see aspects of it in your text um, through, uh, and throughout your text. So those were the four principal uh, origins, I would say, of metacognition. And we did, we did refer to Flavel in the, the first mm. chapter of the text because we saw that as, as important as well. That's a really important context for, mm. for having an uh, so, understanding of metacognition. So you asked for an example. Let me give you a very basic example. If I ask you to remember a telephone number, how would you do it? So let me give you one, 041-881-0393. Mainstream psychologists have often been interested in short-term memory and how it actually works. And since 1956, psychology undergraduates have been taught that, student, that individuals actually can memorize about 79 digits. But what we've actually found is the number's closer to three to five. So you will remember that number, and the way telephone numbers work is they're chunked. So You'll remember the 041881, and then you'll do 334, usually, is the way that your memory works. So that is, and, and people are conscious of that, too. They, they will know their own strategies for remembering phone numbers. Right. That is metacognition at a, very, at a very basic level. That's an excellent example. I think we've all done that. <laughs> yeah, really. So, um, so these strategies that people use, I mean, it can be taught, those are based in uh, mm -hmm. sort of um, psychology? Or oh, abs absolutely. I mean, one of, the, one of the, the models you have of the meta-literate learner, it seemed to me to have three sort of elements within it. The first one, of course, is people learn through repetition. And actually, repetition gets a very bad name in modern educational theory. But you will not learn anything without repeating it. And of course, you don't need to repeat thing, something by rote. You can repeat it by reformulating, paraphrasing, etc. So what I saw in your model there was a form of, of repetition that uh, is, is extremely interesting. So I, I mentioned the phone number you'll have about 30 seconds of short-term memory to remember that phone number. If you don't 
rehearse that information within 90 to 120 minutes, you'll forget it completely, which will then commit it to long-term memory. So I see within the, the meta-literate learner an assimilation of information and then using it almost immediately. And you have to use it almost immediately or you'll lose it. The second aspect that was very interesting is your emphasis on visual literacy. Uh, a picture literally is worth a thousand words because it leaves within memory. Uh, it's, there's a dual encoding. Uh, a picture will leave a verbal trace, a conceptual trace, and a picture trace too. Whereas texts will only leave a verbal trace. So I see, I see that too. And the third aspect, of course, is, is communal participation. Human beings learn better when they learn collaboratively. I, I see all, that, all the three aspects there of good learning practice. Interestingly enough, repetition is, is coming very much back into the fore with regard to educational psychology. Interesting. That's a great point. It was interesting, yeah. too, we were talking earlier how in traditional models of information literacy, the metacognitive piece hasn't really been emphasized as much. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like it's going to be with the, the new ACRL framework, which has mm -hmm. been influenced by metaliteracy. But uh, we were talking, Trudy, about how previously, what, what were the aspects of the, of the four domains that we've introduced that you saw as part of an information literacy originally, but now has been greatly expanded to the, to the four yeah. domains? And before, I think it was really the cognitive and the mm -hmm. behavioral aspects mm -hmm. of um, mm -hmm. being able to find, evaluate, use mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. But now the metacognitive piece mm -hmm. and also the affective piece mm -hmm. because very often people are sort of stymied by mm -hmm. um, sort of fear. Yes, they, they can't are. do it or mm -hmm. everybody else can do it mm -hmm. better than they can and mm -hmm. so why should mm -hmm. they try? Yeah. Um, so these two new components really I think yeah. are um, mm -hmm. really making a difference in both how people are teaching it but right. also um, if people are aware of it, sort of mm -hmm. how they learn. Oh, there's, there's, clear, there's the clearest evidence of, of the effect of component in the, in the scientific literature on, in this area with regard to educational psychology. Um, even, even within the, the scientific journals using double-blind experiments, there was a recent one uh, in Science 2011, and uh, the researchers found that people actually, in, in high-stakes exams, who wrote about their fears and reflected on their fears actually did better in the tests hmm. after the fact. And there's also, there's also a strong belief now in the, the, the idea of, of people... Pe people almost certainly have an implicit understanding of their learning capacity, which is almost certainly wrong. It's formed, <laughs> it's formed very, very early in life, and it's, it's probably, it, the, the reason why thinking about thinking, mm -hmm. metacognition is so important, is, is it challenges that idea. You know, people, it, it challenges people to, to reevaluate their capacity to learn through the affective moment, through the behavioral moment. So the, that's why the thinking about thinking is so important. It's a really good point too because I think learners today, they make, make assumptions that maybe they're not a good writer or they're not good at math because mm -hmm. of an early experience mm -hmm. they had. Mm -hmm. But if they're giving that thought, that reflection later on, mm -hmm. they might completely change their, their thoughts on it. In fact, it's interesting because we talked about how working with students in, a, in an environment and encouraging them to use technology, they might come into the classroom and into an online environment with certain assumptions about their own abilities with technology. Mm -hmm. But if, they're, if we encourage them, challenge them to actually use the technology and then to reflect on that use of technology. And where they succeeded. Exactly, that that's going to have a huge impact on their own thoughts about themselves. Oh yeah, confidence is critical in, in, meta, in the metacognition. Uh, ab absolute, it's absolutely central to the, to, to the way that people uh, feel about themselves. And I mean, that, that's one aspect of metacognition. We sometimes, metacognition sometimes it gives people the impression that we are, um, that we are not, we are talking about conscious thought, conscious manipulation. 
But it's not purely that. I mean, there's great debate in, the, in some of the scientific literature about metacognition in animals and whether, it's, and, and whether animals are capable of metacognition. There's some evidence that they actually are, which would mean that metacognition is, is, is prior even to language itself, which would be which is primor as primordial as, as, as it can get. Uh, there's, there's been, as I said, significant attention paid to this, this idea these days. Uh, um, there's also attention paid to, um, how can I put this, inner language. Human beings spend a lot of time talking to themselves. They might not... The, 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 either in their, within their heads or, or literally talking out loud to themselves, about 25% of their waking states can be taken up by this, yes. So it's a very, very important aspect of being human. So there's been a lot of philosophers of mind have been fascinated about this internal conversation and the way that it enables metacognition. And there's been very, very technical debates on whether it somehow reflects natural language or somehow different from it. But there's, uh, uh, there's absolutely clear evidence that... Me me and Flavel was very interested in the feelings of metacognition. You know, that tip of the tongue phenomenon, like what's the Queen's family name or what's Elton John's real name? Mm -hmm. And then you know that you know that, mm -hmm. but you feel that you know it. Even, mm -hmm. even It's even pre-discursive. So, Again, there's been great speculation on whether, whether metacognition is actually really hardwired into the brain or the capacity to do so. That's an interesting dimension. So uh, this is something that's already happening, whether people are thinking about it or not, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think then that there are, because I think we often think that, uh, you know, thinking about one's own thinking, mm -hmm. uh, you, by foregrounding it, people will be more aware mm -hmm. of it. If people are already doing this, mm -hmm. what's the advantage then of having them be even more aware of this activity? They have increasingly, it's increasingly important that they are conscious of so doing. There's, there is considerable literature that people who think that learning capacity can be increased, their own learning capacity can be increased are far better learners. Um, just in the way that, I mean, if I, if I said to you, you know, if you, if, if you go to a gym every day for two hours, you're going to get stronger. If you think about thinking, if you think about your learning processes, you're going to become a better learner. It really is the same. The, the, the scientific literature is very clear on that. So it has to be not, not only... The telephone number example I gave was is somewhere between consciousness mm -hmm. and, sub, and, and subconscious. So it's a good example, but the more conscious you are about learning, the better a learner you will be. So, Ronnie, could we go back to your question? You mentioned that communal learning, you know, is more effective mm -hmm. learning. And I know very often um, learners say, I don't want to do it that way. I do better mm -hmm. sort of on my own. Mm -hmm. So is there sort of uh, a metacognitive piece that goes mm -hmm. along with the communal? Yeah, the question is, is that people often, the, the benefit of having a conversation or online or face-to-face or -face is that people will repeat what they've learned. They will move from it to some other position, and it will be constantly repeated. I think that's the most important thing. As somebody who is learning on their own, I would advise them to test and retest themselves. In many ways, that's what a conversation is. It's a retest. And that's why uh, the conversational, the, the peer element within online learning, for example, is so important. You're retesting your knowledge. And uh, certainly, uh, I would say to individual learners to, 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 to emphasize, I would emphasize to them the importance that they test and retest their, their own knowledge. I see chunking in your own book your eight subheadings. Mm -hmm. Usually, you know, there's usually about, you could go through it in two goes, you know, eight concepts. Mm -hmm. So, ideally, and uh, almost as a matter of instinct, Authors chunk their text too. That's what an index is. So if you were reading the first four concepts of the text and you've been through it and you wanted to check your knowledge, a simple test within 90 to 20, 120 minutes will do that. Okay. It's just the way memory works. Uh, 
So, I mean, I mean, again, to, to give an example of that, if, if, I, if that phone number was a bit if, that I quoted earlier was, uh, was the phone number of a friend you'd had 25 years ago and you'd forgotten the number, if I brought it to memory for you, you would remember that number easier than a completely foreign number, which shows that it's in there somewhere. Hmm. I have a related question to that example, which I think is such an excellent one. And we think technology and emerging technologies is a key part of this and being able to adapt to these changing environments. But I was just thinking about that idea of how people remember and we, we kind of foreground this idea and the, the chunking even of the numbers as you mm -hmm. described. But is there a downside to the technology too in that now that when you meet someone, you, you put their phone number in your phone and people aren't remembering it the way they, that they do or even having the... The, the rapid dial uh, mm -hmm. bill, you know, you're pushing a number instead of uh, ac the actual number. Uh, even in this a search engine capability where sometimes, oh, people, we always say, oh, wait, let me look, let me Google that. <laughs> yeah. you oh. know, is, is there any kind of fear of, um, is there any downside to, to those technologies in that way? I'm and this sure. isn't quite the same thing, but I noticed now on my phone, if I start mm -hmm. typing something, mm -hmm. it fills in the rest right. of the word for yes. me. So now maybe I don't even have to remember whole words, <laughs> you know. <laughs> There would be, there is, at the minute it's only speculation purely because we're still basically running around with the same genetic programs we had in the Ice Age. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's speculation that but the, that kind of, of, of social evolution can happen fairly quickly. So there, there's been no definitive research on how this will affect our cognitive capacities uh, to do so. I, I think there's a, there is a debit and a credit. Uh, one of the, the credits I've already mentioned is, is, is visual literacy too, in the way that uh, Facebook, Facebook seems to me to work because it works as a narrative. Uh, we've seen the power of the narrative in audience research with regard to uh, soap operas that have run in Europe for 25, 30 years. When the script writers get the story wrong, the viewers write in and, and correct them on the biography. Right. So some of these British uh, soap operas that have ran for decades uh, have continuity editors because they have to mm -hmm. uh, remember over a period of 25 to 30 years mm -hmm. how, this, uh, how these stories have developed and how the characters have developed. Again, it's to do with a visual encoding of information where again, there's, a, there's almost a visual encoding of, a, of somebody's life and narrative structure. So if somebody's presenting information, they really would mm -hmm. want to think about not Absolutely. only textual presentation, yes. mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. visual if they really yes. want to have an impact. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And the multimodality of that, that's such an interesting example of Facebook as a narrative, because that's really what it is. It's yes. a timeline. Yes. So you have your individual timeline, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you're it's intersecting with everyone else's timeline mm -hmm. and it's happening in, in real time and you're constantly getting updates and status yeah. updates in, what, in terms of what people do, are doing. And it's very interesting that we're seeing this shift from the stati status updates that were very textual to the images and now I think we're seeing even more of the, the video mm -hmm. dynamic as, as part of that timeline. So people mm -hmm. are actually taking videos of their cell phone or finding something on YouTube and then that becomes a part of their, their daily narrative. Yes. Very much so. And then that comes back to sort of the value of information, yes. um, both sort of in and of itself, but mm -hmm. also when you say, you know, uh, YouTube right. videos, yeah. knowing the ethics of being able mm -hmm. to use those and Absolutely. that type of thing. So it's all sort of interconnected. Yes. And the idea of the producer, because the producer now with a cell phone, they, they're recording their world, they're making yes. little Animoto videos that are more produced, mm -hmm. and then they're sharing those with with this audience, automatic audience that they have on Facebook. Mm -hmm. the, I think the status updates too have this metacognitive piece to mm -hmm. it. And again, I'm not sure if people are thinking about this because they're, they're providing this daily update, but it seems to be a reflective, mm -hmm. um, kind of an instant reflection in terms of what's going on in their lives. And then the fact that they can like something that other people are doing or they comment on what other people are doing. There's an ongoing sort of uh, commentary that's part of that narrative throughout the day. Yeah. I mean, the, the metacognition may have arisen, uh, a literally a reading of your own mind. It might have 
arisen in an evolutionary sense with the ability to read other minds too. Mm. And that's per perhaps why uh, Facebook has, has become so popular. You're looking at your own life, you're reading your own life, but you're also reading, literally reading mm -hmm. somebody else's. Mm -hmm. uh, again, just uh, it's, uh, that's an insight from evolutionary psych that, that said it's uh, the, the two, the ability to, 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 as I said, understand yourself was somehow related to this capacity to understand others' intentions. Mm -hmm. Really learned an awful lot about metacognition. It's here fascinating, today. and again, to hear of this outside of your own discipline brings a whole right. new perspective right. to it. And so, you've been great today, Ronnie. We really appreciate Thank these you insights. So much, Thank yeah. You. Taking this Wonderful. much deeper, so Thank we really appreciate it. Thank you. And I just want to say to everyone else, as you're reading through the materials this week, and as the the course is winding down. Think about your own thinking. Think about who you are and where you fall in this in terms of being a meta-literate learner. And think of all those different roles and roles that you may have already played out uh, throughout the course. Yes, definitely. And I think I'm going to be figuring out how much time I'm spending talking to myself. <laughs> and if it's less than 25%, I'm OK. <laughs> and I'm going to see how many phone numbers I can actually remember. <laughs> so thanks very much. We'll see you next week. Bye.